I'm Ashley Lorenz, and I'm excited to welcome you to the 2022 Microsoft Research Summit. This event is a special moment for the research community at Microsoft. Conversation and collaboration are such key parts of the conduct of research, from early stage ideation through the creation of new technologies. Here at Summit, we aim to engage across our teams within Microsoft and with the global research community to share progress and explore advances that could empower individuals, organizations, and communities in new ways. Although computing is at the heart of research at Microsoft, our community isn't just composed of computer scientists. We are engineers, designers, chemists, social scientists, economists, people from numerous other disciplines. At this event, we also have business leaders and policymakers, experts from many other fields, working to ensure that new technologies maximize benefits and mitigate risks. We are particularly excited to have students with us, bringing fresh ideas and hopefully building on our progress for years to come. As you'll hear in many of our sessions, our work also involves co-creation with the people, communities, and other prospective users of new technologies. We view these sessions as opportunities to dig into some of the most significant questions about the meaning and impact of our work. How might we further amplify human productivity and creativity? How might advances in technology help to enable a more sustainable planet and a more resilient global society? How can we help reduce inequities in global health and deliver precision health care to everyone who needs it? Ultimately, how might we create the broadest possible benefit for the most people? Over these next few days, we'll explore these questions and others through the plenaries and tracks that form this year's agenda. For our first plenary session, I'd like to welcome Chris Bishop, who leads our global AI for Science organization. With AI for Science, we're bringing together world experts in artificial intelligence and leading researchers from across the natural sciences to create a new paradigm for scientific discovery. Machine learning is playing an increasingly important role in the natural sciences, and over the next 10 years, it looks set to have a transformational impact. The consequences are potentially far-reaching and may dramatically improve our ability to model and predict natural phenomena over widely varying scales of space and time. This goes well beyond the traditional use of machine learning for the statistical modeling of observational data, and it may even represent a new paradigm of scientific discovery. Jim Gray was a Turing Award winner and a Microsoft Technical Fellow. He characterized the historical evolution of scientific discovery through four paradigms. The first paradigm, whose origins date back thousands of years, was purely empirical and based on direct observation of natural phenomena. For example, the 16th century astronomer Johannes Kepler observed that as a planet moves along its elliptical orbit around the Sun, the line joining the planet to the Sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. While many such regularities can be found from observation, their predictive ability is limited. The second paradigm was characterized by theoretical models of nature, such as Newton's laws of motion in the 17th century, or Maxwell's equations of electrodynamics in the 19th century. These are generally expressed as ordinary or partial differential equations, which are derived by induction from empirical observation and they often describe natural phenomena with exquisite precision, and they allow generalization to a broad range of situations well beyond those which were initially observed. Unfortunately, such equations can be solved analytically only for relatively simple scenarios. So it was not until the development of digital computers in the 20th century that they could be solved in more general cases, leading to a third paradigm of scientific discovery based on large-scale numerical computation. By the dawn of the 21st century, computation was again transforming science, this time through the ability to collect, store and process large volumes of observational data, leading to the fourth paradigm of data-intensive scientific discovery. For example, the Atlas detector of the Large Hadron Collider generates data at the rate of 64 terabytes per second. Machine learning forms an increasingly important component of this fourth paradigm, allowing the modeling and analysis of large volumes of experimental scientific data. 
Now it's important to emphasize that each paradigm does not replace the previous ones, but rather these four paradigms are complementary and they work in unison. The pioneering quantum physicist Paul Dirac commented in 1929 that the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known. And the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. For example, Schrödinger's equation describes the behavior of molecules and materials at the subatomic level with exquisite precision. And yet numerical solution with high accuracy is only possible for very small systems consisting of a handful of atoms. The cost of solving Schrodinger's equation exactly grows exponentially with the number of electrons. And therefore scaling to larger systems requires increasingly drastic approximations, leading to a challenging trade-off between scale and accuracy. Even so, quantum chemistry calculations are already of such high practical value that they form one of the largest supercomputer workloads. However, we've recently seen the emergence of a new way to exploit deep learning as a powerful tool to address this trade-off between accuracy and speed for computational scientific discovery. This is a very different use of machine learning from the modeling of observational data that characterizes the fourth paradigm because the data that's used to train the neural networks itself comes from numerical solution of the fundamental equations of science rather than from empirical observation. We can view the traditional numerical solvers for scientific equations as simulators of the natural world that can be used to compute quantities of interest in applications such as forecasting the weather, modeling the collision of galaxies, optimizing the design of fusion reactors, or calculating the binding affinities of candidate drug molecules to a target protein. However, these simulators are computationally extremely expensive. For example, it can take months of computation on a supercomputer to simulate the dynamics of a biological system for the equivalent of just one microsecond of real time. Another problem with simulators is that they represent fixed algorithms that don't improve with experience. From a machine learning perspective, however, the intermediate details of the simulation can be viewed as training data which can be used to train deep learning emulators. In contrast to most observational data, such training data is perfectly labeled and the quantity of data is limited only by computational budget. Once trained, an emulator can perform new calculations with high efficiency, leading to significant improvements in speed compared to direct simulation, often by several orders of magnitude. The use of machine learning emulators can be viewed as a fifth paradigm of scientific discovery and represents one of the most exciting frontiers for machine learning, as well as for the natural sciences. While there's a long way to go before these emulators are sufficiently fast, robust and general purpose to become mainstream, the potential for real-world impact is clear. For example, the number of small molecule drug candidates alone is estimated at 10 to the power 60, while the total number of stable materials could be as high as 10 to the power 180, that's roughly the square of the number of atoms in the known universe. Finding more efficient ways to explore these vast spaces would transform our ability to discover new substances, such as better drugs to treat disease, improve substrates for capturing atmospheric carbon dioxide, better materials for batteries, or new electrodes for fuel cells to power the hydrogen economy. And these are just some of the myriad potential applications for this new technology. To tell us more about how machine learning can be used to accelerate the solution of fundamental equations of science, let me hand over to Max Welling. Physical processes span an enormous range of both spatial and temporal scales. From the formation of galaxies at the scales of light years and giga years, to the scale of molecules at nanometers and femtoseconds. Our goal is to accelerate simulation of these physical processes using deep learning technology. As an example, let's have a look at weather prediction. The weather is governed in part by a partial differential equation called the Navier-Stokes equation that determines properties of the atmosphere at the current moment in time from local information at the previous moment in time. 
Weather prediction is extremely hard because the system is chaotic. Small changes in the weather now can have a large effect down the line. Traditionally, people have solved the Navier-Stokes equation using numerical methods developed by mathematicians. But that solves every instance separately, while the physical equation doesn't change from one day to the next. So the idea of the fifth paradigm is to recycle the solution into a data set and apply machine learning to learn to solve the equation. We call this process amortization. Our solution sends messages in a graph neural network between the points of the integration grid to exchange information between neighbors. With this trick, we can solve the equation many times faster than with traditional solvers. A big challenge with these methods is the availability of large amounts of data. And researchers at Microsoft Research developed a method called LordNet, which can train itself in principle without the data from the traditional solver. Additionally, PDEs respect certain symmetries, which map one solution to another without having to resolve the PDE again. Researchers at Microsoft Research were also involved in exploiting these symmetries to augment the data set and improve the results of the learned PDE solver. A second challenge in modeling PDE solutions is the proper handling of geometric quantities, such as vector fields. Now, a prominent example of a vector field is the wind velocity field. And we have recently developed new methods to make sure the PDE surrogate model understands that it is dealing with a vector field. This led to significant improvements in performance relative to existing neural PDE surrogates. Besides weather prediction, an important application of this technology is plasma simulation in a reactor for the purpose of establishing nuclear fusion. And here we wish to speed up the design cycle of future tokamak reactors. For every design change, one must solve very expensive partial differential equations that describe the plasma as it interacts with the magnetic fields inside the reactor. And like the weather, these equations are chaotic and very expensive to simulate. We are using deep learning to accelerate their simulation, which in turn leads to much faster design cycles. Partial differential equations are the main modeling tool for scientists to describe their domain of interest. If we manage to develop a new paradigm to solve these equations orders of magnitude faster, we can accelerate the process of scientific discovery and make a positive societal impact. As mentioned, learning to simulate or emulate can be applied at many different spatiotemporal scales. And next, Rihanna will explain how these ideas can be applied to molecular simulation and, in particular, to catalysis. The modeling of phenomena over multiple spatial and time scales is of particular importance for the study of chemical reactions, where one or more reactant substances are converted into one or potentially multiple different product substances. In order to simulate chemical reactions from first principles, we need to resort to quantum chemical calculations to be able to describe the bond breaking and forming transformations. While in principle the Schrodinger equation describes the evolution of the quantum state of the molecules or materials, for all but the simplest cases, exactly solving this equation quickly becomes intractable due to the exponential scaling with system size. What's more, chemical reactions typically consist of a huge number of sequences of chemical transformations of the reactants, making brute force exploration of all transformation pathways impossible. In order to tackle this problem, the fields of computational chemistry and physics have a long history of designing approximate computational methods to study these systems with molecular simulation. But despite all of these scientific advances, it remains extremely challenging to simulate to long enough timescales and to be able to simulate large enough systems to a high enough degree of accuracy to allow us to fully study chemical reactions in silico. The need to study long time and spatial scales is especially high in catalyzed reactions. 
In these reactions, a catalyst is added into the mix with the goal to accelerate the reaction of interest, while the catalyst itself is not consumed, enabling it to repeatedly assist in accelerating the reaction. A classic example is the oxidation of carbon monoxide on a platinum surface. Here, the platinum surface ensures that oxygen molecules break apart into two separate atoms much more easily than if the reaction were in a gas phase without the catalyst surface. Through reaction acceleration, catalysts reduce the need for unfavorable reactor conditions, such as high temperatures or pressures, leading to safer and more cost-effective solutions to chemical synthesis and other industrial processes. Catalysts can also influence the rate at which unwanted byproducts are produced, or reduce the need for toxic reagents, aiding the development of green technology. This is especially relevant for the production of pharmaceuticals, where the formation of waste products is an important challenge to overcome. Catalysts also play an undeniable role in our pursuit to shift our supply chain away from fossil hydrocarbon energy sources towards renewable energy resources. Here, one of the major challenges is being able to store energy produced by renewable energy sources such that at moments of high energy demand, this energy can be made available. Now, because of the overwhelming importance of catalysts for the chemical industry, where an estimated 85 to 90% of the products are synthesized through catalytic reactions, lots of research is focused on designing better catalysts. Here, numerically simulating the time evolution of the molecules or materials in the reaction can help us to identify which transformations influence the catalyst performance the most. And scalable simulations also have the potential to help focusing costly experiments on the most promising catalysts, leading to a more targeted catalyst design cycle. However, as I mentioned previously, current simulation techniques are not capable of reaching the relevant time and spatial scales with sufficient accuracy. And this is where deep learning promises to play a crucial role by learning from data sets created by compute-hungry quantum chemistry calculations and being able to make cheap predictions that generalize over multiple systems. A key example here are machine learned potentials that can predict the energies and forces within molecular structures or materials, substituting more expensive quantum chemistry methods. Furthermore, similar to protein folding, chemical transformations in simulations are so-called rare events meaning that in brute force simulations, a lot of time is spent on simulating events other than the interesting rare event. And this is where deep learning and reinforcement learning can aid in steering simulations in order to more frequently sample simulation pathways of interest to reactions. Altogether, hybrid approaches of deep learning and reinforcement learning aided quantum simulations hold the promise to extend simulations to the time and spatial scales relevant for chemical reactions and catalysis, which in turn can contribute towards our goal of reducing our carbon footprint. And next, Karen will tell us more about how research in AI for science can aid Microsoft's efforts towards advancing carbon negative processes. Max and Rian have told us about a couple important areas for environmental sustainability that we expect will benefit significantly from this new type of computational tool. Impact on just these two areas will already be great, but it can go beyond that. At first, it may not seem obvious how understanding molecules or physical processes has anything to do with environmental sustainability. So let me explain. Everything we do for our survival and comfort involves transformation of matter and energy. For example, one way to generate electricity is to burn coal. Coal and a little bit of energy goes in, a lot of energy comes out. Unfortunately, so do a lot of pollutants. Among those pollutants are greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide or CO2. They accumulate in the atmosphere and result in climate change. There's a lot we can do to reduce those emissions going forward, but the only way to neutralize the effects of past emissions is to remove carbon dioxide from ambient sources like the atmosphere. This is currently possible, but expensive, so it's difficult to scale. And we need very large scale. It's estimated that the world emits around the equivalent of 50 billion tons of carbon dioxide every year, of which it's expected we'll need to remove around 10 billion tons yearly. That is no small task. The good news is that more powerful computational tools will help us better understand molecules, chemical reactions, materials, and processes from first principles. Moreover, these tools will enable more rapid inverse design of materials and chemical reactions so we can apply them to this massive carbon removal problem. 
Selecting materials for particular purposes has traditionally been a very linear process. As materials were found, they were characterized and their properties cataloged into a database. Then, when a material was needed for a particular purpose, scientists would look them up in the catalog, find the closest match, and then make modifications to refine it further. Very much a manual search and then trial and error optimization. Inverse design turns this process on its head with huge help from computers. Instead of starting from materials and looking at their properties, we start from the properties we want and use computation and machine learning to suggest new materials that match these properties. We can also use them to help us evaluate how likely different optimizations are to get us closer to what we want so we can finally test them experimentally. Now that I've explained how these powerful computational tools help us design new technology, I'll focus on how we plan to apply these advances toward real impact on environmental sustainability. As I mentioned earlier, human activity involves many transformations of matter and energy, and many of these transformations emit greenhouse gases. So to reach a carbon negative future and address climate change, we'll need to both optimize these transformations so that they result in fewer emissions, and for emissions we cannot avoid, we'll also need to develop and deploy new processes that capture and store away a good chunk of these emissions. I'll illustrate this with a few examples. Let's start with the most logical thing to do, to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We know the plants uh, collect and store carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. That's an incredibly important way to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and temporarily store it. And therefore, it's very important to preserve and replenish natural ecosystems. However, so much greenhouse gas has been emitted to the atmosphere that according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we're past the point where natural solutions alone will be sufficient to keep us within the recommended temperature limits. Beyond what nature gave us, we'll need engineered solutions to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Some of these solutions exist today, but a big barrier to their adoption is how much energy they use and how much they cost. Better computational tools will enable us to design new materials and overall solutions that could make direct air capture economical and scalable. Another area where we expect exciting progress is carbon transformation. The main idea behind this is to use the carbon dioxide captured from the atmosphere instead of fossil fuels to make other important products. A key class of materials for this purpose is catalysts. As Rian mentioned, catalysts give us the ability to change reaction conditions, allowing us to design more efficient and well-controlled reactions with fewer undesirable products. This is true in general, but also the case for captured carbon dioxide. We can use catalysts to make sustainable aviation fuels and easier to recycle plastics, for example, reducing their carbon footprint. Finally, carbon capture and transformations I just talked about require some energy as input. But using energy from carbon emitting sources would defeat the purpose. Luckily, we have been witnessing a transition from fossil fuels to renewable electricity generation. This means converting energy harvested from the sun, wind, and large bodies of water into electricity instead of burning fossil fuels. However, a big uh, challenge to get to 100% renewable energy and complete this transition is that renewable electricity cannot be harvested when the wind's not blowing or the sun is not shining. So there are no guarantees of a constant supply of energy. A solution is to store that energy, and one of the ways to do it is to store it in chemical form, like in rechargeable batteries. Another example is green hydrogen, where energy is stored by using renewable electricity to break water into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen can then be stored and burned when needed, releasing energy when it is in high demand and other renewable sources are not available. Instead of emitting polluting gases, the product in this case is water which can then be reused. Better computational tools will enable significant improvements in the efficiency and durability of materials used in batteries and green hydrogen, paving the way for a smoother transition to renewable energy. We've just covered direct air capture, carbon transformation, and energy storage, areas we're investigating with our newly launched Project Carbonics. These are just a few initial examples where the computational tools we're working on will help us engineer new materials, 
chemical reactions and processes to accelerate progress toward a carbon negative future. And there are many more we could cover. The progress we can achieve toward environmental sustainability, along with the advances these methods can bring to life sciences and human health, that you'll hear about shortly, are transformational. Together, they can add up to significant improvements in quality of life for billions of people around the world. Thank you very much, Karen. We've seen how scientific simulation enhanced through machine learning is relevant to a tremendously broad range of applications involving the discovery and optimization of new materials. But it also has significant potential to help us understand biology and to help improve human health. Let me hand over to Tian Lu to say more about our work in the life sciences. The fifth paradigm of scientific discovery outlined by Chris is very powerful. It provides us with a new way of understanding the scientific world and tackling scientific challenges. Take life science as an example. Previously, people heavily relied on wet lab experiments and instruments like microscope, X-ray crystallography, and cryo-EM to observe biological phenomena. However, biological activities are simply too fine-grained in both temporal and spatial dimensions and it's extremely difficult for us to observe everything of our interests by these means. As an embarrassing result, many things still remain unknown to us. For example, how do proteins dynamically change their conformations and fold to equilibrium structures? How does a molecular motor utilize ATP to generate motions so as to enable muscle contraction or bacterial swimming? And how does ribosome synthesize proteins according to the main information contained in messenger RNAs. Given that wet lab experiments cannot give us the answer to these critical questions, computational methods can be an important alternative. This is because, in principle, we know exactly the laws governing the behaviors of a bio biological system. For example, everything will boil down to the interactions between items according to the Schrodinger's equations. If we can successfully solve the equations, we will be able to simulate all the dynamical details of a biochemical process. This is usually referred to as ab initio molecular dynamic simulation. However, the difficulty lies in that the Schrodinger's equations are too complicated to be solved at a scale, which makes ab initio molecular dynamic simulation for large biomolecules almost intractable. Computational biologists have therefore come up with many approximate methods to trade off the efficiency and accuracy, such as heuristically designed energy potential or force field. However, such approximations will lead to significant deviation, especially when there are chemical reactions involved, which is unfortunately quite common in the biological process. At MSR AF for Science, we target at tackling this grand challenge. That is, we want to simulate the dynamics of large bell molecules with ab initial accuracy, but with a speed comparable to those approximation methods. And our secret source is AI. In particular, we have developed a powerful AI model for molecular simulation called a graph former. It can capture the topological and the relational information between items in a molecular graph, and it can model long-range interatomic effects. Graphformer can be trained with unlabeled molecules in a self-supervised manner up to billions of parameters. With a pre-trained Graphformer, we achieve the best performance on many downstream tasks, including the KDD Cup 2021 on molecular property prediction and the Open Catalyst Challenge 2021. Moreover, the inference of Graphformer just involves the feed-forward process of a neural network, which is very efficient and can fit the needs of a large-scale simulation. Based on Graphformer and several other innovations, we have built a highly accurate and scalable biomolecular dynamic simulation system. With this system, we simulated the dynamics of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and gained novel insights into this virus. For example, we found that the NDD part of the spike protein has a veg effect. Its veg in and veg out will affect the up and down position of the RBD part, and thus the open and close conformation of the overall spike protein. Such a conformation change will affect the infectivity of the virus and can serve as a potential target for drug discovery. 
This result was published as a cover page article in Advanced Theory and Simulation and got great attention from the research community. Well, our research on accurate and scalable ab initio biomolecular dynamic simulation has achieved some progress. We firmly believe that this is still the beginning of a long and exciting scientific journey. Our eventual goal is to conduct ab initial molecular simulation for fundamental life phenomena in silico, including chemistry of metabolism, response to stimuli, and self-replication. This basically means that we must go beyond the capability of simulating individual bell molecules like proteins and need to deal with much more complex bell systems like viruses and cells. However, the simulation of even a single cell is extremely challenging. First, it requires a lot of knowledge, such as what kind of and how many bell molecules are there inside a real cell, where they are spatially located, and how they are grouped and compartmentalized by membranes. Fortunately, the research community is making nice progress along this direction, and we now have more and more knowledge about that. And second, although a cell looks very small, it may contain billions or even trillions of items, and life phenomena usually emerge in a long time span, like microseconds. How to further improve our AI-based app initial biomolecular dynamic simulation system to such a gigantic spatial and temporal scale is highly non-trivial. It may take years of additional efforts and exactly one of our moonshot projects. If we can eventually achieve this goal, we will open a completely new window for exploring life science. Just imagine, someday we can simply sit in front of a computer without doing any wet lab experiments and can accurately simulate all the biological behaviors of a cell and then an organ, a body, and eventually intelligence. That is going to be not only a revolution in life science, but also indicates a brand new chapter of artificial intelligence. How amazing that day would be, and what a great impact we would be making. Well, there is still a long way to go, we believe, with the continued efforts from the biologists and our AI researchers, sooner or later, this dream will come true. Thank you to Yan. We've heard so far how AI for Science could accelerate catalysis, environmental sustainability, the life sciences, and the fundamental equations of science. Another area where we believe AI for Science will have a big impact is in drug discovery. Discovering and developing a medicine is a long, expensive, and complex process. It takes tens of thousands of compounds, several hundred researchers, and thousands of experiments over a period of six to 10 years just to get one medicine on the market. However, on average, 90% of candidates end up failing in the clinical stages of development. We learn after this long process that the medicine is either not safe enough or effective enough to help the patients. The drag of that attrition rate means that the R&D spend for each medicine that does get approved is around $2.6 billion. In order to improve success rates and reduce the time it takes to get a safe and effective medicine to a patient, scientists need to find high quality targets and importantly, molecules that can safely modulate those targets in patients earlier on. Drug discovery usually starts by identifying a key piece of the disease biology that we can manipulate and we explore whether revving that up or shutting that down would have a beneficial effect. That key piece of biology is usually in the form of a protein, which is coded by our genes or a protein in microorganisms causing a disease. Molecular design strategies are used to find a small molecule or an antibody that can provide the desired biological response while maintaining acceptable absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion properties in the body. As Chris mentioned earlier, the number of small molecule drug candidates alone is estimated at 10 to the power of 60. It is this immense size of chemical space that makes the identification of molecules for drug discovery an extremely difficult task. In fact, the pharmaceutical industry has been using the four paradigms in parallel to explore this chemical space and find potential drug candidate molecules. Over the past decade, we've seen a massive investment particularly in the fourth paradigm. 
Pharmaceutical companies of all sizes are making significant advances in data-driven drug discovery through making internal and external data sets fair, findable, accessible, interpretable, and reusable, and through applying machine learning and computational approaches to accelerate and make better decisions in every step of the pipeline. At Microsoft Research AI for Science, we're working in collaboration with Novartis, where together we are empowering scientists with generative and predictive models to speed up the discovery and development of breakthrough medicines. We are focused on machine learning and accelerated simulation methodologies that are applicable in many of the steps of the design, make, test cycle of candidate molecules. This includes the development of methods to automatically design molecules with the desired biological and physicochemical profiles, such as binding to the biological target related to the relevant disease. We're also exploring approaches to reliably predict how best to synthesize molecules in the lab, as well as human-in-the-loop procedures that aim to optimize processes to reduce time and costs. The machine learning-based workflow we've developed together is now being used by scientists at Novartis to design novel compounds, predict their activities in silico, and synthesize them in the lab. It has been very exciting for our team to embark with Microsoft on the generative chemistry project. And it is rewarding to see our joint progress and the fact that we are synthesizing compounds based on the input we are getting. Combining our complementary scientific and technical skills and knowledge gives us a much bigger chance to reach our joint goal of transforming pharmaceutical research by leveraging large data sets and computational power. Going forward, it will be important to keep the eye on the implementation of what we have created, but importantly also on pushing the boundaries further. In this respect, I'm really looking forward to engage in the molecular dynamics and track discovery together. And thank you so much for the great collaboration. We've seen tremendous success so far through the use of the fourth paradigm of science to speed up existing processes and drive insight into the way that scientists design, make, and test molecules for drug discovery. However, biology and chemistry are still extremely complex, and we really don't understand most diseases very well. The next step, the opportunity now, is to take approaches from the fifth paradigm, through the development of deep learning emulators to accelerate science, to augment and complement the other four paradigms, and ultimately advance scientific discovery that brings high quality medicine to patients. Thank you very much, Bonnie. We've seen how the evolution of scientific discovery can be viewed through the lens of successive paradigms, with machine learning playing an increasingly central role. These five paradigms are complementary, and they can be used collectively in the quest to discover new drugs and materials, and to better understand physical, chemical, and biological phenomena. Perhaps in years to come, we'll see the emergence of intelligent agents using techniques such as active learning and reinforcement learning that will help scientists to marshal these resources more effectively, bringing together all five paradigms, drawing on existing domain knowledge through natural language processing of the scientific literature, and finding efficient ways to explore the combinatorically large space of possible solutions through a mix of efficient emulation, an expensive but accurate simulation, alongside high throughput experiments in automated wet labs. This is an exciting frontier, both for machine learning and for the natural sciences. At Microsoft Research, we're building a new team called AI for Science, encompassing multiple disciplines across machine learning, engineering, and the natural sciences, and spanning multiple geographical sites in Europe, Asia, and the US. While it's difficult to predict how far or how fast this field will go, it seems certain that the next 10 years will be a period of exciting scientific advances and significant real-world impact. Yeah.